Well, good evening, everybody. I think we'll formally start the webinar. People are still registering. And um, I'd like to welcome uh, all of you from all over Australia. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, tonight, of course, we've got uh, Reverend Canon Phil Ashe, and I'll introduce Phil very uh, shortly more formally. But uh, we're going to try and talk about religion under the Biden administration and what implications, if any, there is for Australia. Now, the old saying you would all be aware of is, you know, the, the US sneezes and we get a cold here in Australia. So there are implications for um, down under countries such as ourselves. So we'll look at that in a moment. But before I do all that, I'd like to introduce, of course, my co-host, David DeLima, the South Australian um, director. And of course, David has um, it, it, been with me with all the webinars for the last two years now. And David, of course, is a very great supporter and a very good Christian brother as well. David, I'd like to hand over to you to, to open in prayer and say a few words. Thank you, David. Yes, thank you, Greg, and good evening to all of our webinar participants. Let's just can start our meeting tonight uh, committing ourselves to God in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the United States of America and for its tremendous role as a beacon of freedom, a bastion of freedom. We thank you for its role to help to build up other nations, uh, especially after the Second World War. And Lord, we long to see America, as we do Australia, being a vessel useful to your own plan and purpose. And Lord, as we pray for Australia, we pray for the United States that there would be reformation, repentance, revival and renewal. Mm -hmm. And so we commit to you the leadership of America under President Biden. We do pray for him, Lord. We have many concerns, but we do recognize that he occupies a very important position and we are duty bound to uphold him before you and we do exactly that and i do pray tonight as a result of our seminar that we would be in a better position to pray for the president and for other leaders in the united states and that your your holy spirit would speak to all of those leaders and bring your conviction it's only from you that that conviction can come but you will use us as your instruments you will use people like uh, Canon, Phil Ashey and others who are speaking up and making their position very clear, calling for the president to turn away from wrongdoing. So help us tonight to understand better what is going on, that we may pray and that we may be useful in bringing about all the changes that you would love to see, both in the United States and in other Western nations, indeed, in all the world. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, thank you very much, David. Really appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to get on to the topic straight away. And of course, our speaker tonight is Reverend Canon Phil Ashey. Now, Phil is the president and CEO of the American Anglican Council, I believe, which is based in uh, Loganville in Georgia. And um, uh, Phil, of course, is a national organ runs a national organisation, and I believe your your mission, I guess, for the one of a better word, would be to ensure that the the Great Commission is is is, is enacted uh, throughout yeah. the United States of America. Phil, I really appreciate you coming on board because one of the issues that we face here is, and I and and I and I hear uh, alert you to the fact that we get news reports from various. Um, uh, really, religious and church organisations in the US, and uh, and I read every day things that are happening over there that inevitably, inevitably will end up impacting Australia. And uh, it was a right. pleasure to speak, speak to you because I know there are a lot of things happening there in the in the US in the terms of the in, in terms of the faith uh, movement, and in particular under under um, Joe Biden, um, who's said to be a Catholic. But some question his Catholicism, but that's not for me or or, or my um, co-host here, David, to judge on. But what we want to do is to get you to give us an in, uh, an insight into what would happen uh, if certain legislation proceeds in the US, and in particular, of course, uh, I'm talking here about the Equality Act that I've heard so much about, because that could well have implications for Australia. So, Reverend. Canon Phil Ashy, over to you, and thank you, one, for being our guest uh, tonight for our webinar. Thank you, Phil. 
Uh, thank you, Greg, and thank you, David, and thank you all who are listening. It's an honor to be here with you today and uh, to speak to my brothers and sisters in Christ all across Australia. And uh, we do have wonderful bonds of, uh, of fellowship and love in Christ. So uh, it's, it's an honor to share with you. Um, there's a lot we could say about uh, the threats to religious freedom in America under the Biden administration, but I want to focus on one piece of legislation here, which is, uh, we call it uh, HR5, House, uh, House of Representatives uh, uh, Bill Number 5, which is known as the Equality Act. And here's what it does, Greg. It, it amends the Civil Rights uh, Act of 1994 that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity, among other identifying factors. And sponsors claim it's, it's necessity in our very pluralistic society to combat bigotry deriving from one segment of the population that they believe is marginalizing another. And, really what they're saying, if you look at some of the um, comments of the framers of this, is, is they're uh, particularly focusing on Christians and people of faith as marginalizing other. Uh, and so they believe that these outdated modes of belief can be held privately, but they must be banished from the public sphere. And by adding um, sexual uh, orientation, gender, and identity to the Civil Rights Act, uh, it equates sexual and gender identity to race, okay? So if I had to break it down, think about HR 5, and what I'm going to say is five implications, five groups of people uh, that are going to be impacted by this legislation if it passes. It passed narrowly in our House of Representatives, um, the, what we call Congress, uh, but, but then it's waiting in the Senate for approval. And it's less clear that it can pass in the Senate because it may not have a majority, but there's a lot of you know, horse trading going on right now in the Senate over this. So let me start with the five implications. And these are around five key provisions that are central to this, uh, to this act. Number one is the Equality Act broadens the term sex and redefines what it means to be a gendered human being. So, you know, as, as Christians, we are binary, right? Because uh, God made them male and female. That's all that we know, okay? Uh, the Equality Act upends that. Uh, it accepts and assumes a non-biblical anthropology. And therefore, if you believe, as Christians do, in binary gender, uh, then, uh, based on what the Bible has to say, that would criminalize your belief under certain circumstances, uh, particularly when expressed in the public square. Secondly, is what defines the public sphere? And the wording of the act broadens the definition and could be used to include places of worship. Uh, so these uh, new regulations based on a new anthropology treat scripture and other religious texts as being mere opinions. Uh, and uh, no doubt they would be made legally discriminatory and morally offensive as the act essentially abolishes a Christian metaphysical worldview and makes it criminal in the public sector. Third impact, uh, churches would not only be the only target. The bill makes it discriminatory to treat abortion and gender transition therapies and surgeries as anything other than simple medical procedures that everybody ought to have access to, regardless of your personal religious convictions. And so that would uh, uh, have an impact on medical professionals, hospitals, and other places. Fourth impact, uh, private clinics and ministry centers. The act broadens the meaning of the term public accommodation so in other words, if there's a public accommodation that um, a charitable organization or a, you know, a rescue uh, mission or a homeless shelter that's faith-based has by virtue of uh, opening itself to the public, 
the Equality Act could apply to them as well. And so as the definition of public accommodation and, and public expands, the space where people can express their religious convictions diminishes. And so we have diminishing circles of freedom, therefore, for people of faith, of all faith, to express their convictions. And in a moment, I'll, I'll, I'll describe how that's impacted specifically on, um, on Christian bakers, for example. And then number five, um, and this is perhaps one of the most troubling dimensions is that the Equality Act specifically eliminates as a defense uh, to uh, people of faith, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Let me just say a little bit about that. The, the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act was signed overwhelmingly under the Clinton administration, uh, another Democrat administration, um, because states were recognizing that federal law could be used to encroach and ultimately limit in the ways that, that HR 5 is now attempting to do. Uh, and so it carved out at the state level certain exemptions for people of faith uh, that they could stand under in terms of hiring practices, public accommodation, worship, marriage, all those kinds of things. Well, the, the Equality Act specifically states that uh, the Religious uh, Freedom Restoration Act will no longer be permitted as a defense uh, for anyone who is sued uh, under the provisions of the Equality Act. So that just removes uh, uh, freedoms and protections for people of faith and opens the door to uh, increasing litigation. Those are the five impacts, okay? But I think, you know, someone I, I'd like to quote is a, is a theologian from the Southern Baptist Convention, I believe. And, and this is what he wrote. Um, he said, the Equality Act is a farewell to a Christian metaphysic. The problem with the Equality Act, Andrew Walker writes, does not lie predominantly in the statutory language of the bill but in its long-term effects, further transforming the moral imagination of a nation from anything resembling a Christian social order. And the Equality Act, he says, in my view, is a symbol for the deconversion of the West. And you know, uh, people a lot brighter than me, like Carl Truman and others have written about the rise of the emotive self uh, the modern emotive self in America, in our North American culture. And I, I suspect that has a trickle down effect in Australia as well. Um, you know, that, that we're no longer subject to reason, but rather to feelings. Even one of our own Supreme Court justices, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy, uh, in a uh, uh, widely quoted passage from Casey versus Planned Parenthood laid the foundations for Obergfell and the uh, um, opening of, uh, of gay marriage said, you know, that the essence of freedom as we define it in our culture is the ability of the individual to define happiness for himself or herself, however, and whenever, and to whatever degree that he wants completely divorced from any moral compass, completely divorced from uh, the kind of tradition and history that faith-based movements, churches of all kinds have had in shaping the moral conscience of the United States. So, so let me get back then to, okay, well then if this HR 5 actually goes into effect, if the Senate actually passes it, Who's it going to impact? So let me identify five groups of people that it's going to impact. Number one, it's going to impact employers and workers. And the best example of this is bakers, those involved in the wedding industry. You've probably heard of a guy named Jack Phillips. He's a Colorado Christian who's uh, had a, a cake shop that has been under relentless assault 
by transgender and other sexual identity activists. He's been hauled before the Colorado um, uh, Civil Rights Commission multiple times. His case has gone up to the Supreme Court. He's been upheld in his right to refuse to bake a cake you know, that celebrates uh, gender transition or uh, a same-sex wedding again and again, but he keeps getting sued, okay? And so even when victims like Jack Phillips win legal battles, uh, conflicts like these have a chilling effect and they discourage people from opening new businesses or entering into certain fields entirely. And so if you're a Christian today and uh, you know, you're thinking of uh, entering uh, into the baking business, now is not a good time, frankly, uh, given what HR 5 portends and the increasing um, legal activism uh, of, uh, of transgender and same-sex attracted um, legal activists. So that's one group. Medical professionals. The Equality Act would force hospitals and insurers to provide and pay for these therapies against any moral or medical objections. And it would politicize medicine by forcing professionals to act against their best medical judgment and provide transition affirming therapies. And you know, the fight is already here. Catholic hospitals in California and New Jersey have been sued for declining to perform hysterectomies on otherwise healthy women who want to become male. <laughs> and a third Catholic hospital in Washington settled out of court when the ACLU sued them for declining to perform a mastectomy on a gender dysphoric 16 year old girl. And these kinds of cases would multiply under the Equality Act. Third group that would be negatively impacted would be parents and children. And this politicization of medicine would ultimately harm families by normalizing hormonal and surgical interventions for gender dysphoric children as well as ideological education in schools and other public venues. You know, Greg and David, I was talking with uh, one of our bishops who was just at a camp. Um, this is an Anglican camp. And, and he said 10% of the young people there by virtue of the kind of indoctrination that they uh, have had in the public schools identify themselves uh, as suffering from gender dysphoria. And one of them actually, you know, um, said uh, as a matter of conscience that she would not participate in religious services at a religious camp. And so, you know, the bishop had to send her home. Um, this, this kind of uh, discrimination against parents would become mandatory in the future. Uh, the latest issue of the American Journal of Bioethics, for instance, includes an article arguing that the state should overrule the parents of gender dysphoric children who do not consent to giving them puberty blocking drugs. And in fact, we've got a case in Ohio where parents lost custody of their 17 year old daughter because they declined to put her on testosterone supplements. These are actual cases. Fourthly, women are gonna suffer under this because what the Equality Act does is it, it, it dismantles sex specific facilities, sports and other female only places. So for instance, two areas. Number one is restrooms, bathroom facilities, showers. Um, we, uh, we're concerned that this kind of misapplication of the understanding of equality will um, allow members of the opposite sex to come into female specific showers, bathrooms, and actually enable sexual assault. And then finally, these, these policies leave women at a disadvantage in sex specific ports, uh, sports and other activities. So we've got a case where two, uh, recently two biological males who identify and compete as women took first and second place at the Connecticut State Track Championships. Uh, and the, the female runner lost the race and the chance to be scouted by college coaches and selected for athletic scholarships. And this is what she said. She said, we all know the outcome of the race before even it starts, it's demoralizing. And then finally profits, nonprofits and volunteers. So 
a lot of good work uh, that gets done in culture is done by nonprofit uh, faith-based organizations like the Union Rescue Mission, Salvation Army. Um, uh, you can think of homeless shelters. Um, so we've already got a case in Anchorage, Alaska, where a man identifying as a woman came to twice to a homeless shelter that was a faith-based, faith-run homeless shelter for women who are abused. Okay, and I understand. Women who are abused are seeking help in a homeless shelter because they're afraid of males. And all of a sudden a male comes and says, you've got to let me in because I feel I identify as a woman. And that's what matters. And the city of Anchorage took the, the, the side of this person who was turned away. And ultimately, uh, this has, uh, has gone up to the higher courts. Uh, and now I was just talking with someone from Alliance Defending Freedom with whom we're building a, a close relationship. And because the city just changed a little something, now ADF is having to file a new lawsuit against the city. So again, this is, has a, a chilling effect. Uh, and, um, and it would cost our country countless charitable organizations uh, that, that do great work, you know, faith-based organizations, uh, you know, adoption, adoption agencies, homeless shelters, soup kitchens. Um, so so these, are, uh, these are the effects that this hallmark piece of legislation, which kind of sums up so much of the various progressive agenda that the Biden administration promised, um, that's what we're looking at. So let me just pause there and um, see if there, if, if you have any thoughts, Greg and David and, and the audience. Thank you, Phil. Um, you're on the right track here because a couple of things I need to sort of raise with you as we get into it more deeply. Um, one of the things that concerns me, Phil, is that biblically, you know, we're told pay Caesar what Caesar is due. Uh, in other words, we respect our elected authorities, um, but up to the point where it doesn't conflict with your faith, in my view. Right. So, so all this that's happening, I mean, you've got, a, you've got a president now, one of the most pro-LGBTIQA presidents in the history of America. You've got a right. president that is so pro-woke um, and cancel culture sort of um, uh, sort of views. Why does he insist on having legislation that affects only maybe 10 or 11% of the US population? And secondly, what do you say about the issue of church and state, Phil? In other words, are these legislations coming in because the church is not making enough noise or is it because churches don't want to get involved in politics, Phil? Well, I, I think, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Why are churches not more involved? You know, I, I think part of it is um, a desire, um, you know, from 1 Corinthians 9. Uh, sometimes I think uh, in the effort to be all things to all people, that by all means we might win some to Christ we forget what the Apostle Paul also said in Romans 12 um, about not being conformed uh, to the world in our thinking, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Yeah. And so as Christians out of a desire, a generous desire to reach lost people, we try not to be offensive uh, and, and we try our very best uh, to, uh, um, to not press hot button issues or exacerbate the cultural divides that we already feel in our increasingly polarized culture. Uh, and I think that makes Christians timid. Um, and I think sometimes it actually makes them compromise with the culture in ways that are not healthy. One of our strongest um, advocates for religious freedom is a man named Russell Moore, 
who was leading the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission and the Southern Baptist Convention. And he had this to say, he said, there are two kinds of churches that are not going to survive in North America mm -hmm. uh, in the face of this incredibly secularizing and, and even post-secular, post-Christian culture that's driven by the new religion of identity politics. Now, you know, the reality is, as Russell Moore points out, that what, what Justice Anthony Kennedy said in the Sweet Mystery of Life uh, passage in Casey is a promise that cannot be fulfilled. It's, it's logically impossible for everybody to define themselves any way they want without, any, without bumping into anybody else. That's just fantasy. And people are going to be broken. They're going to be shattered by this. They're going, as we're finding out from people who've undergone gender dysphoria mm -hmm. uh, and, and gender transition operations, they're going to be shattered. And they're going to be looking for a place that they can find healing. There are two kinds of churches, Russell Moore says, that are not going to be available. One is the church that out of fear compromises and just gives into the culture. The other is the one that out of fear hates the culture and, and draws the wagons and circles the wagons and becomes a ghetto unto itself, okay? We've got to be, an, uh, what I've been preaching through the, through the, AA, the American Anglican Council is we got to go back to what the early church fathers under the Diocletian persecution recognize as the greatest example of a faithful Christian operating in a hostile culture, and that's Daniel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, good. David, have you got some questions there we can go with? I've got a couple of others, but I'm sure you have too, because the questions yes. are rolling in. We do indeed have uh, plenty of questions to consider, and thank you, Phil, so much for that excellent presentation. Uh, President Biden has said, we are all God's children. We should treat each other as we would like to be treated ourselves. So how come this doesn't extend to the unborn? Well, that's a very good question. I think there's a huge blind spot uh, with regards to uh, preserving the life of the unborn. And, you know, I could talk a lot about the uh, the abortion industry, uh, about the, the financial um, incentives and the money that's being made, there are actually some shocking um, uh, statistics and figures and reports about how, um, how aborted fetuses have been used for research and the fetal tissue has actually been uh, put on the market. It's, it, it's actually an industry. And I think there are financial incentives to this that are deep rooted. Uh, it's not simply a matter of um, um, people exercising freedom of choice. I mean, there, there's, uh, I mean, I, th this hits home for me because I have a daughter who was born at 24 weeks, five days uh, and was a pound and fit in the palm of my hand. She's now about, uh, 34 years old. Uh, she has significant challenges, but uh, I've become, frankly, just personally, I'm a single issue voter uh, in the United States because I believe that abortion is a Holocaust and it's brought judgment on our country. Um, frankly, if you look at uh, some incredible testimonies, uh, like the story of Steve Jobs mm. of Apple, you know, who, who could easily have been aborted, but for the fact that his mom had a change of heart. How many gifted, intelligent, uh, incredibly rich uh, in character people have we lost to our society because of the Holocaust of abortion? Mm. Uh, and I will, and that's why I encourage Christians, wherever they are, to be absolutely clear on this. I mean, Psalm 139, is absolutely clear about the sanctity of life from the womb. And, you know, <laughs> we have to stop this Holocaust. Yep. And I, I don't believe there's any excuse uh, that 
that uh, President Biden can call upon. I think the Roman Catholic Conference of Bishops uh, recognizes that, and that's why they're having open discussions about excommunicating him and other Catholic politicians who promote abortion from communion. Yeah. So, Phil, the Catholic Church has a very strong pro-life and binary recognition of human reality. Uh, yes. But Biden has had a conservative Catholic upbringing. So what forces have produced this change of mind in his in his circumstance? Well, I can't speak personally for President Biden because I don't I don't know all of his story. Um, I'd love to sit down and talk with him and reason through it. But, you know, I think he's got a, a constituency. And, and again, this is an example of where uh, people of faith um, can end up uh, out of fear of alienating their constituency, uh, compromising on fundamental biblical principles. Um, it's pretty clear within the Democratic Party today that if you are against abortion, you've got very little chance of succeeding in the electorate. And that goes all the way back uh, to Casey versus Planned Parenthood. Um, I think the uh, relative Governor Casey was about the last pro-life Democrat uh, that had any uh, kind of a national stage. So, uh, you know, uh, this has been the trajectory of, of that particular party. And turning to the question of Christian bakers and cake decorators, are they yeah. simply going to refuse to make any customized cakes and just have to sell off the shelf. And if that's a pragmatic response, is it a proper response? That's a very good question. You know, I'm not a, I'm not very good at cooking, so I'm not a baker. So I don't, I can't appreciate, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the struggle that, that they must have. But I, you know, how sad if someone who's a gifted baker is reduced to, to having, uh, to, to limiting their craft that way. Um, and yet we know, um, you know, the lady up in, uh, in Washington, uh, uh, Baronelle Stutz, you know, went out of business because she was fined uh, over $100,000. Uh, and there, no, uh, there, there was no appeal beyond that. So I, I certainly am not going to, I'm, I'm not going to criticize uh, Christian bakers if that's where they ultimately have to land by virtue of litigation. Um, I, I understand that, but I, I hope and pray that's not the case. Yeah, Phil. A good question has just come in. Now, if the LGBTIQA, wokeism, cancel culture, uh, the progressive left, I actually call it the regressive left, but that's another story. Phil, if these actions and activists continue, Christianity will be forced to go underground. What are we going to do about it? Well, um, let me go back to Daniel, Greg, because I think Daniel is a great example of not going underground, um, but faithfully engaging the culture. Yep. So you know the story of Daniel. Yeah. And uh, of course, um, because of the wickedness of Israel, they were carried off into culture. But here's the thing that I would I would like to remind all of our readers of as they think about uh, Daniel. And that is, it says that uh, the Lord delivered Israel into Nebuchadnezzar's hands. Okay, so in the face of this overwhelming, conquering, yeah, fiercely uh, anti Jewish culture, anti faith based culture, if you will. All right. What does the Bible say? The Bible says God was in charge. God allowed this to happen. There is a purpose in all of this. 
Um, second thing I'd like to encourage our readers to remember is that Daniel did not reject the culture. Neither did um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? Yes, the culture did everything it could to try and re-educate them and re-indoctrinate them, including changing their names. But all it took was for these boys to walk into the, the cafeteria and realize, as it says, uh, uh, Daniel resolved not to eat because the food wasn't kosher. Now, they didn't storm the palace. Uh, they didn't wave placards. Uh, they didn't take violence or set off bombs or anything like that. But they said, look, we're going to be your best citizens. Mm. Okay. Uh, but you need to give us, you need to carve out an exception for us. So they engaged within the system, all right? And sure enough, uh, at the end of their test of eating just vegetables, they were uh, better, better looking, better in mind, better in spirit. And as a matter of fact, it says that, uh, that they were found to be 10 times better than any of their contemporaries. And one sees this kind of incredible influence that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had time after time after time in getting the gospel out in a very pagan, hostile, and even occult culture. And it says, there's a little note there at the end of Daniel chapter one. It says that, that Daniel served until Cyrus. Well, that was about 48 years. And we did a little uh, calculation the other day. Um, what would it be like to have the kind of resiliency and faithfulness and impact that would, uh, uh, if you thought about it today, would cause a Christian in our country to have been a key influencer in the Ford administration, the Carter administration, the Reagan administration, Bush one, Clinton, Bush two, Obama, Trump and Biden. I mean, just think about that. Yep. That's the kind of person Daniel was. So what I wanna to say to our listeners is, um, there may be some ways in which we are gonna to have to be smarter and work closer to the ground, but let's not give up engaging the culture yet. Let's be like Daniel and let's take the risks and resolve you know, and that word resolve is a Hebrew word that means Danny was so soaked in the Bible and in the scriptures and thought ahead and anticipated uh, what the challenges would be that he made a decision. He drew the line and he would not compromise. And he was willing to pay the cost if necessary. Thank you, um, Phil. Um, you've reminded me through that I've got to change my diet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> David, over to you. Over to you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Phil, in relation to Daniel, is there anyone who is giving wise counsel to the president? And Jimmy Carter is uh, the Democratic elder statesman. Is he exercising any influence on the president? You know, I don't see President Carter exercising much um, counsel on President Biden. Um, I know from sitting in on calls um, that the White House has weekly uh, with faith-based organizations that it's, it's less receiving input from faith-based organizations and more enlisting faith-based organizations to do COVID-19 vaccines and, and things like that. So I, I am aware that there are some faith-based Christians uh, close to President Biden who are trying to advise him, but I'm not, um, I don't know how close they are to him. And can you tell us, does, uh, in your opinion, Donald Trump have any hope of returning to the presidency? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think he's the presumptive uh, kingmaker uh, in the Republican Party by virtue of his popularity and his capacity to raise funds. Um, I think there are many 
um, people of faith in the Republican Party who uh, are looking for a kinder, gentler version of Donald Trump, uh, one that 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 calls, uh, as Abraham Lincoln said, on on our better angels. And that's not to say uh, to disagree. In, in fact, I think um, Christians, biblically faithful Christians, would have to say that the Trump administration was about the most friendly and helpful uh, to the cause of religious freedom than we've seen in decades. Um, but I think there are people who could carry on those policies uh, who are uh, who are also. Uh, possible candidates. And the question here about compulsory voting, which we have here in Australia, uh, I understand in, in the United States, you've got to keep enrolling just to be able to vote, let alone vote. Whereas in Australia, once uh, you're on the electoral roll, you stay on the electoral roll. Would those kinds of changes in America, that is compulsory voting and once you're on the roll, you stay on the roll. Would those changes, if they were to occur, would they help mainstream Americans to obtain better leadership? In other words, would that be an improvement or would it make things worse? That's a good question. Um, you know, I'm not sure that the, the idea of compulsory voting restrictions, uh, what I'm aware of is um, the fight right now that we have uh, on uh, between just opening wide um, without any checks and balances at all, uh, of voting rights, uh, which leads to things like ballot harvesting and, and, and other kinds of um, abuses of the system uh, versus uh, restrictions that, uh, that could deter people from voting. And I think we've got to find a balance. Uh, uh, and and I, I, I do believe that, frankly, the issue is not so much with the voting as it is with the hearts and minds of people. Um, I think as Christians, we have to bring the issues uh, back into the public square here in North America. Mm. Uh, and we have to do it in a way that is winsome uh, that is capable of, um, of withstanding the kind of demonization and cancel culture that we find uh, in the media. I think we have to be patient. We have to be the kind of people who are willing to be persecuted if necessary and to still speak truth with love and not, and not cave in. And over time, I believe that we can change hearts and minds. But it means that like Daniel and his three companions, where we can, at whatever level we can, and I would argue that the local level is the best place to start. The school boards, yeah. for instance, yeah. are the best place to start. Um, that we have the opportunity to be salt and light and should be and must be and cannot give that up. Phil, interesting, you're, you've touched on a topic there uh, earlier, but one of the reasons I keep coming back to the church is sometimes they are their own worst enemy, Phil. I'm reading yeah. that uh, there are suggestions by certain Catholic uh, bishops in the US to, to not give communion to President Biden. There are now, I'm reading, the Methodist Church in, in the US is now going to count in its um, statistical uh, summaries. They're going to include non-binary people. Um, right. So why don't the churches in the US get together and say, look, Mr. President, you're going in the wrong direction? Um, because churches can be their own worst enemy sometimes, Phil. Right, right. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, I, I think we, we do have to get together. So one of, the, one of the things that is in my heart is to say, well, um, in, in the, the case right now where we have a president 
who's surrounded by people who frankly are hostile mm. uh, to people of biblical faith. It may be a fool's errand uh, to simply keep running that, you know, mm. running to him because we know what we know what the answer is going to be. Mm. Mm. But what if we as Christians came together across denominations yep. uh, at a local level? And began to address the needs in ways that uh, that say, "Look, we are we are not just angry people. Mm-hmm. We're not ho- homophobic, racist, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, fascists, or anything else. We're people who ge- are genuinely concerned about the welfare of our communities, Amen. and we do it on the basis of biblical faith. And we're willing to partner." With, with people who don't share mm. our convictions, mm. but share our dreams for uh, a community where, uh, you know, where people uh, can be uplifted and built up and where we have freedom to share uh, our convictions. Uh, and, you know, I look at the educational system. Mm. Okay, the educational systems, frankly, public educational systems in our country, are not doing well. Mm. So what if Christians came together, you know, and the Lutherans that I know who are great at quality Christian childcare, you know, what if they worked with, uh, with the Anglicans who could resource homeschool networks, mm. who could, and work with the Baptists who are setting up private Christian schools, who could work with the Presbyterians who are setting up you know, after school uh, technical programs so that when people who are not gonna go to college, um, um, you know, have some kind of training in the, in the skills, you know, that we could, we could actually supplement and enhance uh, on the basis of faith-based solutions together uh, mm. and, uh, and, and create a better system of education mm. that would have an impact for generations to come and provide you know, a witness to who Jesus is and his love, his transforming love. So Amen. yes, I believe in that at that level mm. uh, as probably the best way for us to go, the best strategy in North America at this time. Amen. David? Yeah, a question about the Republican Party. Will the Republicans move f- further from the conservative agenda into a libertarian mindset in order to obtain favorable media coverage and thereby success at forthcoming elections. There's a great book that was written by um, a wonderful Christian named Rod Dreher. It's called The Benedict Option. And I'd encourage our readers to take a look at it because I think it's a a blueprint for the way Christians ought to think about engaging Uh, and how churches ought to think about restructuring themselves. And one of the points that Dreher makes is the exact point you're alluding to, David. Uh, And that was in April of, I think it was, uh, well, 2019 maybe, where the Indiana uh, uh, governor backed away from the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. He was a Republican and he did it principally for business and libertarian reasons. Um, that's kind of handwriting on the wall, <laughs> to use another phrase from the book of Daniel, okay? And uh, I, I think what Dreyer is saying is, look, our hope and our citizenship is not in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Uh, our Messiah is not a political figure, it's Jesus Christ, and our citizenship is in heaven. And where political parties reflect biblical positions, we should go and support them as much as possible. I've identified myself as a single issue voter, all right? So you can predict how I'm gonna vote. It doesn't mean, however, that I won't critique the people that I'm voting for on other grounds Mm on other biblical grounds, okay? And, and that reflects my commitment as a follower of Jesus to say, look, my primary allegiance is not even to this country that I love so dearly and whose independence we celebrated yesterday. 
praise God for the freedoms that we have. Um, but ultimately my citizenship is in heaven and I'm all about the kingdom of God. And that's what we have to be about as Christians. You know, uh, my savior is not going to be the next Republican candidate for president. Okay. My savior is Jesus. And to the degree that a particular candidate supports the, what the Bible says I should believe in and the positions I should take on the issues of the day, I will support that person and engage politically. But I'm very clear about where my heart lies. Amen. Another question, Phil, uh, to what extent are the churches responsible for the rise of anti-Christian politics? Yeah, I think there's a good case that could be made that with regards to um, particularly um, what we describe as uh, uh, people of color and minorities, um, and people coming in from other countries, that um, one could make a case against um, conservative evangelicals, um, Protestants uh, in the United States that uh, they, they actually had an opportunity to build bridges to those populations that actually are biblically faithful, but failed to do so because they were so preoccupied with other issues. And that has resulted in some of those communities um, compromising on other issues. So I think you could make a case that the church in North America is responsible to some degree uh, for, uh, for the situation that we're in. And, you know, um, I think that there are plenty of mainline denominations that have in fact caved in uh, on, um, on matters of, uh, of politics, on moral issues, on things like abortion. And, you know, you've got um, in my own former denomination, the Episcopal Church, um, you know, the, the Coalition for Reproductive Rights that claims it's faith-based uh, and is advocating for more abortion and lessening of, of uh, restrictions. So to that degree, yes, I'd say uh, people who are identifying themselves as people of faith are actually aggravating the problems in our country. Phil, a quick one. Um, one of the problems we have here in Australia is our media tend to be left-leaning, progressive, very much onto the, well, equivalent to your Democrat. Do you find the media there are very pro-Biden, anti-Trump, pro-progressiveness? Uh, and if so, what do you as a church or as an organisation uh, do to ensure that your voice is heard in the public domain? Yeah, this is becoming an increasing concern for us. I think, um, yes, we do have prominent conservative voices like Fox News, okay? But much of the, the social media uh, is uh, run by liberal elites and we do have increasing problems with uh, people of faith being canceled and mm. removed from social media. Um, this is a great concern. Um, I am hopeful that this will come before the U.S. Supreme Court as a First Amendment issue um, in terms of regulating the, um, uh, the, the, you know, information technology industries. Mm. Uh, I think they're exercising a, a very dangerous precedent in canceling people. Great. David? Um, yeah. yeah, another question. Can the Democratic Party be reformed? I really can't answer that because I don't have much contact with the Democratic Party. I do think there are people of faith, however, in the Democratic Party that uh, are, are working to try and... Um, 
and move the party into more biblically faithful positions. But I don't know the extent to which they're having any success in that. And a number of evangelical Christians were anti-Trump. You've mentioned the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar certainly had feet of clay. Uh, are the anti-Trump evangelicals now rethinking their position? Are they, are they sorry to see him go? I, um, I, don't, I don't know. I, th I, I think there's a certain amount of um, quiet resolve that I'm hearing among uh, the people that I, uh, you know, journey with, um, uh, that things have got to change. Um, I think there's a lot of lamenting uh, that Christians are having who may have voted for, for Biden, but are, um, are wondering uh, where the country is going. Uh, and then I think there's, there's people, frankly, who are just not aware and choosing not to be aware of things like HR5 uh, and the threats that it brings because it's, you know, it's, um, it's inconvenient facts uh, that, that challenge a general worldview that they have uh, and, um, and uh, challenges and undermines their own reasons for voting for Biden in the last election. Thank you. I think, Greg, we've got time for one more question. One more quick one, David. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, and that is uh, well, clearly the way forward is for more conservative Christians to become active politically. Is that happening, Phil? Are conservative Christians in the US becoming more active to shape the culture and its leadership? That's a very good question. I do think, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm seeing people of faith who are uh, uh, one would describe as conservative, um, increasingly giving voice to their, uh, their faith. Uh, and I think that's very encouraging. Um, I'm about to go to a gathering of anywhere from 100 to 400, we're not quite sure yet, um, uh, Anglicans in, um, in Charleston to talk about the Equality Act and what we should do uh, and I'm aware that there are um, going to be people, um, political representatives there who, who are going to be in attendance um, to express their own faith convictions, uh, uh, biblically faithful convictions. So I, I think there's some of that. I think of the younger generation. Um, I think around causes, not so much around parties, but around certain causes, I think biblically faithful Christians, uh, particularly in the millennial generation, are going to come alongside those issues uh, and, and step in. Whether they will actually run for office, I don't know, but my, my hope would be uh, that we can, we can get some of them you know, to, to consider politics as, as a vocation. Uh, in the same way that that Daniel operated, that it's a it's a legitimate, worthy, and honorable profession. Um, you have to take your risks, and you may not always win, uh, but it's worth resolving and making a stand. Uh, and it's good for the good of the whole. Uh, that we've we've got to have Christians who can articulate a common good for the nation. Uh, and. Uh, and, and, and do so on the basis of biblical values. Amen to that, uh, Phil, because biblically, I know that, uh, you know, a lot of the apostles and the disciples fought the Romans. And of course, uh, they were involved in politics, in my view. So we've got to make sure that more Christians in politics. Phil, thank you very much. Uh, I have a real fear that the Equality Act may filter through to Australia. Uh, there is every possibility of that happening, and we as Christians um, really take up arms, I guess, in some ways. But, uh, Phil, thank you very much for your insight. Uh, I know you do some wonderful work over there, and, uh, and uh, we are blessed to have you here tonight. Uh, I'll get David to close in prayer for me, and, um, and then we'll say goodnight. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Phil, 
for that uh, presentation. It was full of insights. And thank you particularly for referring us back to scripture, back to the book of Daniel. And we do pray that God would rise up people like Daniel. So let's pray that right now. Our Father, we thank you for the information we've received today. And we pray that you would galvanize our resolve to serve as salt and light. We lament mm -hmm. the way in which so many of these troubles have happened under our watch, so to speak. And we do pray for the churches of the United States, especially that they would be able to be touched by your Holy Spirit, leading them towards authenticity in their ministry as salt and light. And we do pray for Phil Ashey and other Anglicans mm -hmm. in particular, who'll be meeting shortly to discuss strategies for moving forward. And may they indeed be guided as Daniel was to stand up, to pray, to be authentic, to be truthful, uh, as well as loving. And we do pray that the president would at least heed the message of the book of Daniel, that you are capable of casting down kings from their thrones. Mm -hmm. But we do pray that wisdom would prevail, that wise counsel would be given. And we do pray for the president that he would repent of his pro-abortion and, and uh, pro-same-sex uh, marriage so-called agenda and for the other things which are um, coming to America as a result of his leadership. We, we pray that you will turn him around. May he return to the faith of his youth, to the wonderful influences yes. of biblical Christianity which are there. And we do pray that uh, they'd be nurtured by perhaps even President Jimmy Carter and by others uh, in the Democrat Party. We pray for that party, that it would return to its roots. We pray that America would return to its roots and be useful again as a vessel in, in your hand. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you very much, David. Our next um, webinar will be on the privatization of the ABC, which is our national broadcaster, Phil. So that will be interesting because they, they, they have seemed to have gone a bit woke and uh, we need to address that. So Phil, on behalf of the governing board of the Family Voice Australia, we thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for sharing your faith and your insight into the way forward. Um, I want to thank everybody that joined. The webinar will be available in a week or so. We thank you for joining us and I bid you farewell and good night to everybody else. Good night. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Phil, and good night.